Hey everyone, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz. And today for continuing on our Vlogmas cold case files. A long awaited one since the press conference on December 8th. We're going to be talking about the boy in the box. Now the boy in the box is something I actually covered last year, yesterday on my channel. I'll put it in a card above where I go into a lot of the detail of his case and I'll kind of talk about a little bit of the detail of his case today. I'll probably just talk about all of it because this I love this case. This is one of the cases that I wanted to be solved or I wanted him to be identified. Like I talked about it in a previous video, especially about the lady in the dunes. The Lady in the Dunes and The Boy in the Box were two cases of the true crime community that I've wanted solved for a long time, and finally they were. But anywho, so on Thursday, December 8th, the true crime community received news about the case that we know, we forever know as The Boy in the Box, of a case that has traumatized Fox Chase, Pennsylvania, since 1957. So on December 8th, we learn the identity of the boy in the box. Joseph Augustus Sorelli was born on January 13th of 1953, but unfortunately he would only be known as the boy in the box after the gruesome discovery of his body on February 25th of 1957. Now on that day, the discovery of his battered and bruised body would be found wrapped in a plaid blanket and placed inside of an old bassinet J.C. Penny box in the woods off of Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase. Initially, he was found by a young muskrat trapper or young man that did muskrat trapping, but this man didn't report finding his body because he was afraid that the police were gonna take his traps. Just a few days after this, a college student saw a rabbit while he was driving down the road and he saw the rabbit go into the woods. Well, what he decided to do was stop because he knew that there was animal traps in the woods. So when he stopped his car, he went into the woods and that's when he would find the boy in the box. Now he didn't report the crime or him finding the boy that day. He ended up reporting him the following day. So because of this, the actual investigation into the boy of the box would start on February 26th of 1957. Police took his fingerprints and they wanted to do that to keep them on file just in case they would be able to identify this boy via fingerprint analysis. Now, initially, the police in this case were extremely confident that they would find out who this boy was. But unfortunately, that hope would diminish because nobody came forward with any information and nobody came forward to claim this boy. It was as if he was completely forgotten. They had over 270 police academy recruits help in an effort to recomb the area in which this boy was discovered. And it's during this search they found a child's scarf, a man's corduroy cap that was blue, and they also found a white handkerchief that had the letter G in the corner, and it was a man's handkerchief. But none of this led anywhere. None of this gave cops any clues as to who this boy was. The police also went as far as releasing a post-mortem photo of this boy being fully dressed and him in a seated position with the hopes that somebody would claim this boy or somebody would recognize this boy, but that did not help with finding out who he was. It was determined during his autopsy that his body was heavily bruised, but it was determined that his hair was roughly cut on his head and it was recently cut. And they believe it happened after he died because there was still clumps of hair on his body. His body also showed severe signs of being malnourished and starvation. Along with this, they also found severe bruising, which happens when you are malnourished or you are starving. You'll have distinctive bruising on your legs and specifically your legs, it shows up first and then the rest of your body. It's kind of like stippling or um, kind of like circular-ish bruising that shows up on your legs. 
and they can be like a deep purple and sometimes like a lightish blue at first, but then they'll go to a deep purple. But that's not all they found on his body. They also found scarring on his body. In particular, they found surgical scars on him. These were on his ankle, his groin, and he also had an L-shaped one on his chin. So possibly he could have like hit his chin and I believe when they mean like surgical, like stitch-ish scars. So if he hit his chin and busted it open, he probably had it stitched shut. Now, after a period of time, this case went cold and he was buried. Now, initially he was laid to rest in a potter's field, but after they exhumed his body in 1998 to extract DNA, he then was reburied in Ivy Hill Cemetery by the son of the man that initially buried him in the potter's field. This man then buried him in a proper, in a proper plot with a headstone that had the engraving of America's unknown child on it. Now for years, this case has literally like wreaked havoc on the true crime community. Everybody wants to know who he is. It's been on our radar. Everybody wants to figure out who killed him. And everybody is just kind of like shocked why nobody has claimed this boy. But finally on December 8th, like I previously mentioned before, we would find out who he is. We would find out that the boy in the box was publicly named as Joseph Augustus Zarelli. With the help of the DNA extraction that happened in 1998, of which they extracted DNA from his tooth, this DNA sample, as spotty as it was because of how old his body was, it took two and a half years for this particular person to kind of piece it back together to make it a viable sample. Now, this sample would be given to a woman named Colleen Fitzpatrick. Now, what she didn't know at the time is that that sample she would, she would be given would blow this case wide open. Colleen Fitzpatrick, like I mentioned, she she received this DNA sample in 2020. And after two and a half years of babying, babying this sample to make it a viable sample for a DNA and geneal genealogical analysis, she was able to run that testing on this DNA sample. With this analysis being run, she was then able to make a full list of potential family members with using the help of public DNA websites like Ancestry, 23andMe, GEDmatch, MyHeritage, and also a huge thanks to public genetic records. So she was also able to find Joseph Zarelli's family and eventually would find his birth certificate. Now, with how this is worded in the press conference, one would assume that his family does not have the same last name as him, which maybe that means he was adopted, he was a foster child. The way this is kind of worded and was given out to the public makes it seem that there's different names used for this family. Now there's a lot of speculation. There's already been a lot of people that are like, well, oh, he has another brother with the same name. How do you know that's the same Zarelli family? If they let it know that we found their birth certificate, maybe he just shares the same last name as his mother, but his birth father has a different last name. And what if his last name is actually, you know, the same last name as his adoptive family? Because if we found his birth certificate and the police, like they mentioned, they are withholding his parents' names as a safeguard. Maybe he does not have the same last name as his parents. There's a lot of, there's a lot of speculation when it comes to his family, especially because he has quite an abundance of siblings and all of them were shocked about this. And with me reading this as well and hearing about this, it makes me assume that they had no idea that he was even a thing. And if they had no idea about him, that means that his parents probably gave him away. Then they were probably trying to hide something. So if that's any indication about or same like acknowledgement of like what you think is possibly what went down with the boy in the box, I feel you because 
as a person that with my my background my family background we have a lot of people a lot well not a lot but a few people that are adopted in or we have fostered them and obviously they don't have the same last name and then for them to find out oh hey you have all these cousins or just for us to find out that oh hey we have like random ass cousins everywhere else it's really hard for those to kind of understand when they're told because you're always you're always raised one way and then you find out something completely different. I know that was kind of a little bit of a tangent, but that's that would be how his siblings feel right now. And if his parents are still alive, then they have to now because his siblings know that they have they have a brother that died back in 1957. They then feel the guilt and responsibility of, hey, I never knew my brother because something happened to him. And now the guilt that his parents might feel if they're still alive of never telling their other children that they had another brother. There's a lot of like, it's, it's a hard situation kind of to go through. So after this discovery, Obviously, it was made public that the boy in the box was to be identified. Then we had the new press conference. It was also mentioned in the press conference that his gravestone will be updated with his proper name, so it will no longer have the words America's Unknown Child. Police are skeptical on whether or not they will actually figure out who, in fact, killed him, but they have a slight glimmer of hope. And it's not the same glimmer of hope that they initially had when they found him in 1957. It's that slight glimmer of hope that maybe, maybe genetically they'll be able to figure out what, what exactly happened to him. Maybe it was his parents that are, in, that are responsible for his, his death. We don't know. Maybe it is his adoptive parents that's responsible for his death. But what I do have for you is some theories that people have. So there is one theory that's called the foster home theory. There is quite a few theories and I'm only going to talk about the main two because these main two really kind of give like a, a good understanding of the time that he was found in kind of the two different, the two different theories of this story that kind of give you a different perspective. So the first one is about a foster home that was located about a mile and a half away from where his body was found on Susquehanna Road. Now, in 1960, there was an employee of the medical examiner's office. Now this man, his name is Remington Bristow, and he stuck with this case until, I believe it was 1993 when he died. He contacted a psychic in New Jersey and Without even letting the psychic know about certain things of this case, this psychic told him that he needed to look for a house that matched this specific details. Now, the details she gave him, he knew this building. It's an old foster home that's located a mile and a half away from where the boy was found. Well, what he also did is he brought the psychic to the area of where the boy was found on Susquehanna Road. And after he brought the psychic there, the psychic then led him exactly to the foster home without being prompted. So if some of you viewers don't believe in this stuff, that's fine. I, I am enthused by this stuff, I'll say that. And this kind of some people might not believe what happened, but some people can pick up on certain things like that. I personally believe that something led her to that house. Maybe it was his energy that's still in that area from where he was found. It is possible. After this, Bristow then attended an estate sale at the foster home. And while he was attending the estate sale, he saw a bassinet that is the exact one of the box that he found, well, that was found with the boy in the box in it. This bassinet was sold at JCPenney. 
he also went on to find similar blankets that were on a clothesline as similar to that of the ones that Zarelli was found wrapped in. Now, Bristow believed that this boy was the child of a girl who was the stepchild of the man that ran this foster home. And not wanting her to be exposed as an unwed mother, they, her stepdad took care of the boy and then would dispose of the child's body. When police looked into this claim, they traced all the children that were in that foster home and confirmed that they were all accounted for still. They also looked into that father and stepdaughter and lo and behold, they ended up getting married years later, which is kind of weird, but ultimately they found nothing to corroborate any of this story. That So that's kind of like theory one. Now theory two corroborates details that police never released publicly about this boy. And for me is the more believable one. So this theory is about a woman named Martha or a woman with the letter M as the start of her name. Or she just used the letter M as her alias. Now this theory came out in 2002 and this is when a woman who is only identified as either M or Martha, she talked to the police about something. Now her story, the police believed was plausible, but at the same time they were extremely troubled by it because they came to know that this woman she had some history with mental illness and not not dissing anybody with mental illness sometimes when police hear that they'll instantly be like no i can't believe you there's something wrong with you no well she claimed that her abusive mother bought a boy who was named joseph from his birth parents in 1954. now if that's the same joseph zarelli then in 1954 he would just be about a year old after buying him, he was then subjected to extreme SA and physical abuse for about two and a half years or until about 1956. There was one evening in particular and he he would throw up his meal, which was baked beans. And after this, he would be severely beaten and his head would be slammed against the floor until he was in a semi-conscious state. After this, beating he was then put in the bathtub and it said that he died during the bath after he died his hair was then like savagely cut and this was because the boy had very long hair which was distinct and martha's mom cut it in an effort to conceal his identity and then she forced her daughter to help her dump his body well When they went to, on the side of Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase, it said that a motorist stopped to help them or to see if they needed any help. And this is when Martha said during the interaction, her mother forced her to stand in front of the license plate to conceal the license plate number in case the motorist noticed it. Martha's mom then was able to just get them to go away because they didn't need any help. And she then forced Martha to help her lift the boy and place him in the box. Well, this exact story was corroborated by a confidential testimony that was taken by police by a male witness in 1957. <clears throat> what, what I will reveal kind of after this kind of makes me mad about this whole theory because it, it was corroborated. This testimony revealed that this body was placed in the box as it was already discarded there by this male, that like this male witnessed the whole thing and absolutely corroborated everything that Martha said. Now what shocked police about this as well is that she mentioned things that were key pieces of evidence that were never revealed. The coroner found remnants of baked beans in the boy's stomach and his fingers were wrinkled as if he was in water. 
And also his haircut was never fully revealed because when they released the post-mortem, they just put regular hair on him to make it seem like he was alive. And none of this was released. Like at, in the beginning, none of it was fully released. Now police were unable to verify her story and apparently neighbors of Martha's mom said that they never saw a boy in their house at this period of time. And they, they just dismissed her testimony as being ridiculous. I'm sorry, if you have a male, a confidential male testimony that corroborates her story, then something, something is off with the police that were looking into this. I'm sorry. My hope is that they will figure out who did this to this boy. This boy did not deserve any of this, any of this injustice against him. But I'm happy he finally has his name back. With that being said, what are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments down below. I want to know what you have to think about the boy in the box. And I will see you guys tomorrow in another Vlogmas video.